So um, today we're going to be talking about working with nature to tackle the climate emergency. My name is Susanna Gill and I'm from the Mersey Forest and my colleague Alex Gemwa, who's also from the Mersey Forest and Cheshire Western Chester Council, will be um, will be leading you through the workshop session at the end. It's a brief overview of what we're going to cover today. So first of all, I'm going to um, give some thoughts about what we'd like you to think about in preparation for the workshop as the end as we go through the presentation. I'm going to talk very briefly about the climate and nature emergencies and the need to act on them and that land has a role to play as part of wider action on this agenda. Um, and that we're talking about all land here. So we, we call this collectively our green infrastructure. Um, and we'll talk in particular about the interests of the Mersey Forest and the importance of private gardens in, in this. Um, and I'll go into a little bit more detail on some of the roles that land can play in help, helping to tackle the climate and nature emergencies. And then we'll think of a little bit about what we can do as individuals to help and some resources that are available for that. And then Alex will lead us through a workshop where we go into that in a little bit more detail. So in preparation for the workshop, as I go through the presentation, it'd be great if you could think about examples of what you might already be doing, how you might already be using natural solutions to help with climate and nature emergencies any future actions you'd like to take either individually or as part of your communities and think about any private space that you've got available to take any of these actions or or public spaces which may be suitable for them and and what the barriers are that stop you from taking action if you can please use the chat box throughout the presentation and and then in the workshop use your team's hand and if we're unable to get onto any points today, then we'll follow up via email. So first of all, the climate and nature emergency declarations have been made by Cheshire Western Chester Council, along with many other local authorities, um, national government and international organisations. We have an urgent need to act to both reduce greenhouse gas emissions and importantly, store any residual emissions, so hard to eliminate emissions. Our current emissions in Cheshire West and Chester are four megatons of carbon dioxide equivalent per year. Now this is largely from industry and transport and buildings. As a council, um, the council wants to be carbon neutral as an organisation by 2030 and as a borough by 2045. And if we look at what carbon budget is available, if you sort of divide up the Paris Agreement aspiration to keep under 1.5 degrees C. Um, you see that there's only six years worth of current emissions for the council. So it's really important to bring down those emissions as quickly as possible in order that we can sort of eke it out and have more years available to us to carry on. Um, we also, as well as bringing down these emissions, we need to adapt to inevitable changes. So in this part of the world, we're likely to see warmer and wetter winters, hotter and drier summers, and an increase in the frequency and intensity of extreme events. So we're talking about things like extreme rainfall causing flooding, um, uh, prolonged drought, and dry periods where we have the opposite, um, and heat waves and so on. And the, and the consequences, how we tackle and deal with those. We need to think about bringing the climate and nature emergencies and our actions on them together, um, because we see nature is also in long term decline, but it underpins our existence as a society. These two, these two emergencies are linked, so climate change further drives nature's decline, but restoring nature can help to tackle climate change. Um, so land has a role to play as part of wider action on this agenda from the council's land action plan. Um, we need to act immediately so that by 2045 all land in Cheshire West is helping to tackle the climate and nature emergencies with wider social, economic and environmental benefits. We need to optimise land use so that we reduce greenhouse gas emissions, store these re residual emissions and help to adapt to inevitable change. 
So I am talking about all land here from, from things that we would consider countryside, wetlands, woodlands, um, moorlands and so on, agricultural landscapes through to more what we consider more urban parts of our green infrastructure, so green spaces and parks and allotments, um, street trees, neglected land um, and even our own private gardens. As the Mersey Forest as an organisation, we're particularly interested in the trees and woodland components of our green infrastructure. So we have a vision to get more from trees to help make Merseyside and Cheshire one of the best places in the country to live. But our private gardens are really important, especially when you look at the built up, the more built up parts of, of our areas. Um, so here you can see a picture of Chester. The only part that is not green space is, is marked in grey. Um, the red that you see there is private gardens. So it's a really important part of, of the green space that we have in urban areas. It accounts for at least half of all the land in built up areas and between um, and, and gardens account for between a quarter and half of all the land in built up areas. So a large part of our green space types. Um, however, gardens, as we know, are not all green. Um, and the study in Manchester has shown that on average they're only half green when you start to include things such as um, built structures, sheds, um, driveways and so on. So land has a number of roles that it can play in helping us tackle the climate and nature emergencies. Um, on this side here on the left, you'll see um, what it can, some of the roles it can play in helping to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and store emissions. So helping to produce food, sequester and store carbon, provide low carbon energy and materials and helping us reduce the need to travel by car. On the right, some of the roles it can play in helping us adapt to inevitable changes include supporting biodiversity, keeping us cooler, managing water in an integrated way and providing a resilient outdoor recreation and visitor resource. And I'm just going to look in a little bit more detail at um, the four areas, the four roles that are in yellow there. So land has a role to play, an important role, to, a crucial role to play in producing food. We obviously have the broader agricultural context, but here I'm looking more at um, the kind of urban um, context of food production. So 23% of the fruit and vegetables that are eaten in Britain are grown here, only 23%, a quarter. Um, some recent studies have shown that urban food growers can produce a similar yield of fruit and vegetables to conventional farming, um, but they do so using fewer pesticides than conventional farming and, and help support pollinating a wide range of pollinating insects. Another study has recently shown that if all available land, all available urban green space was used to grow fruit and vegetables, we could grow up to 40% of our own domestic consumption which is up to eight times what is currently produced. And there's clear, a range of clear benefits, including providing local produce, reduced food miles, limited pesticide use, um, benefits for biodiversity and human health and local food security. Another role that our land has to play is to help us sequester and store carbon. Um, this takes place in soils and vegetation and varies by habitat. Um, so here you'll see a, a kind of schematic diagram which shows over time across here how different habitat types um, sequester and store the, um, the carbon. So if we look at peatlands here to start with, um, they're the largest store of carbon but they sequester it quite slowly, however very importantly they sequester it indefinitely have the ability to, to carry on removing carbon from the atmosphere indefinitely. However, degraded peatlands are actually a large source of emissions. Um, so um, action to help restore those can reduce emissions and help return them over many decades to be a carbon sink. 
Woodlands are another really important category here. You can see they have very large sequestration rates at first, the largest of all habitat types, but they do decline over time. But when a woodland reaches maturity, um, it still provides a substantial carbon store. And woodlands are interesting because if there are harvested materials from them, um, that timber continues to provide a carbon store while it's in use. Um, and it can also be used to replace fossil fuel intensive materials and fuels. Um, hedgerows and orchards and trees also play a role in sequestering and storing carbon. Another role is in helping to keep us cooler. Um, so we know that um, with climate change, the, in, the um, we're likely to have a lot hotter summers with more extreme events. And these in extreme situations can result in increased deaths, especially for more vulnerable members of our society, elderly people, those living in urban areas. And green space has a really important role here to play in helping provide shading, evaporative cooling and channeling cool air into urban areas. Um, we've, we know the urban heat island effect results in um, neighbourhoods that are greener, um, are, have cooler temperatures associated with them. And, and, and the final role I'm going to look at is um, helping to manage water in an integrated way. Um, so here we see what we've been calling the COVID curve recently. Um, this is what happens over time as um, are following a rainfall event. So we have very intense runoff leading to really high peak flows of water, um, really sort of flashy kind of system, which results in a flood. What we can do is use natural flood management techniques, um, sustainable drainage systems to help flatten that curve, um, protect our NHS from being overwhelmed or protect our drains and rivers from being overwhelmed. Um, we're reducing the rate that the water flows off at, um, reducing the peak and slowing down the timing of that by doing things such as um, providing extra surface extra surfaces to, with the vegetation to catch the water, slow down the flow um, and stop it reaching the rivers and drain so quickly. So what can we do as individuals um, in terms of wider climate change activity? There's a recent campaign that's been launched based on research from the University of Leeds, the JUMP campaign. Um, I'd urge you all to take a look at that. Um, this is kind of broader action on climate change that we can take. But there's a range of land based actions that we're going to be talking about today. So actions that we can take within our gardens and homes, um, planting trees within our gardens, making them more wildlife friendly, mowing our lawn less often, growing food, making our own compost and using peat free compost, reducing pesticide and weed killer use thinking about the products we use in our gardens and homes and using certified wood when we can, remembering that's an extra carbon store as well. Um, things including installing green roofs on our shed, um, capturing rainwater in our garden with the use of water butts. Um, an important one, I think, not paving over our front gardens um, for car parking and so on and trying to keep them permeable to allow water to get into the ground. And um, potential to disconnect our properties from the drainage sewers by managing water on our properties, so creating rain gardens and so on. Within our neighbourhoods, a range of actions that can be taken as well, um, looking at what are, what's in our local areas, what could potentially um, be available to plant trees on, getting involved when there are community tree planting events, um, involved with friends of groups to help manage local green spaces, um, supporting initiatives um, which reduce the frequency of mowing on land. Um, again, I think that's probably quite an important one as we sort of try and shift the way we are managing land, bringing, bringing communities with us on that. Um, food growing, a range of food growing things um, just getting out and enjoying local green spaces and valuing your 
woodland and countryside around you, supporting schools and encouraging them to take action and, and getting involved with neighbourhood planning um, in your area. There's also a range of um, environmental charities that can be supported who work in, the, in this kind of area. So the Woodland Trust and Cheshire Wildlife Trust are two examples. The Mersey Forest, we have a supporters newsletter, a supporters group that you can sign up to for free and which um, gives more information. And the council have got their climate emergency newsletter that can be signed up to too. There's a few other webinars coming up in this series um, that you can get to via the link there about using peat in your garden, upcycling in the garden and climate proofing your garden. Um, which will go into some of these topics in a bit more detail. And at the Mersey Forest, we do have some resources available to help support in particular tree and woodland design, establishment and management. This ranges from kind of larger scale woodland creation to very small scale um, tree planting and hedgerow creation. So if there's something you'd like support with, please do get in touch we can talk about what might be available to help. The council have also launched their climate emergency fund, um, which is open to bids until the 22nd of April this year. Um, and that has money available to support community initiatives and projects, which can include natural capital and environmental projects as well. So the website's there to get in touch too. So thanks for listening to this presentation and I will hand over to Alex who's going to take us through the workshop session. Thank you Suzanne for your presentation and good afternoon all and thank you so much for being with us this afternoon. Um, as Suzanne has outlined and at the very start, uh, that uh, it is our intention just to tease out from uh, from all the attendees, if possible. I'm cognizant that we might be running out of time, but we'll try our best to try and hear from you. Most most importantly, uh, the, there is things going on on out there which residents are actually doing at this point in time, and it is our desire just to share examples of how residents are using natural solutions to tackle climate change and cl nature emergencies in their own backyard and neighborhoods and stuff like that and also uh hear your suggestions of how uh any ideas you might have so that uh, they can be developed either individually or across your communities and obviously uh, try and help identify some public and private spaces where you are which are can be made available uh, for this use. So uh, without any further ado, the floor is open. If anyone has got a contribution along those lines, it is most welcome. Uh, alternatively, you can type it in the chat and uh, someone will get back to you with an answer. We we'll kind of uh, reply to those requests. What we are not going to do specifically is answer, for example, specific questions relating to a specific site, which might have been, you know, which people have got specific questions around it, that, you know, we, we will try and take those specific questions to the relevant departments within the council uh, where possible. So, yes, uh, that's all I have to say for now, and just uh, open to questions, please. Can I say something? Yeah, go ahead, uh, Peter. I did put a question in before the, it started about Inch Marshes and the fertilizer factory down on Inch Marshes. I, 50 odd years ago, uh, landscaped the, the factory. We planted thousands of trees, uh, but when I, I've not really been down there properly, but I've had a little bit of a quick look and uh, some of the trees are planted are doing quite well, but quite a lot have, have vanished because of development. And that seems to be a bit sad. Um, I don't know whether you you know who who maintains the fertilizer factory now and the trees around it. Do you know? 
Yeah. No, thanks, Peter. Suzanne, have you got, uh, do you want to come in if possible, please? Hi, Peter. Yeah, we did see your message and we've passed it on to the tree officer at, um, at the council. Um, and he said he didn't think it was council owned land. It was before his time. He thought it was privately owned land and he wasn't sure who was responsible for the management of that um, land. But I can I can pass you on his details if you'd like to follow it up with him and have further conversation. Well, um, if you go on Helsby Hill and look down on its marshes, the, the trees are, uh, are doing quite well from, you know, looking from Helsby Hill. And that was part of the, the, the plan was to plant a, a load of trees to try and hide the factory from from Helsby. A bit of a tall task to do because Helsby is quite high up compared to its marshes. But they do seem to be from a distance doing quite well. And I just thought, um, could could Mersey Forest adopt that and look after it properly? I, I, I say I haven't I haven't walked it. I don't know how it how it's going on, uh, but the uh, the access road to the fertilizer factory from Mints, I landscaped that and tree planted that, but a lot of the trees are not there now because it's been developed. So, what my my question is, it doesn't seem to be. The developers don't seem to care if they're removing trees and planted areas, and that's we're not we're not going in the right direction there, are we? Yeah, I mean we can't really comment on the individual case, Peter, because we I mean we weren't involved in it and haven't been involved in it. But I mean it is it is an issue with um new development and planning and, and there are processes in place. So I think um you know, we would we would obviously encourage planners and encourage anyone who who any resident who's concerned to try and get involved during planning the planning stages and processes to to make the case for trees being kept on site, um, other habitats and landscapes being protected for whatever reason, so on to make sure that any new development is being done in the best possible way and to support the planners in helping to make what can be tricky decisions at times, you know, because they have competing objectives that they're having to deliver on as well. So. Okay, I'll leave it to that then. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much, Peter, for your question. Uh, it is uh, uh, very, very, um, very good just to try and unpack some of these, uh, some of these questions. And uh, obviously, yeah, uh, as Susanna said, that has been referred back to the uh, three officers, and uh, that can be followed up again with the planning department if need be for more robust answers if needed. Thank you. Uh, I got an, uh, got a question here, Susan. You got a question. It's not really a question. I was just thinking about what I could do in my own in my own garden and so on. Um, I'd be interested in um, in creating a wildlife pond in the garden, being able to store some of the water that falls within my own garden and reuse it. That kind of thing. Quite interested in 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 that whole agenda: the capturing and storing and reusing of water, um, creating wildlife friendly places as you do it. So not a question, a comment. <laughs> okay, thank, thanks Suzanne for that. And I hope uh, it will be helpful to, to others. Right, I got an, a hand up here from Steph. Uh, go ahead, please, Stephanie. No, hi, hi, Alex. It, just a few questions that are coming in on the chat. So I'm not sure you can see them all. So um, but Lisa's asked, um, how about giving out wildflower seed packets to local schools and households? to enhance wildflower gardens. Yeah, it's a great idea, yeah. Um, another one we had submitted before before the session as well was about schools. So it was how can schools work with their nature, considering their limited budgets, to ensure that we can continue to move in the right direction for our children's future. Yeah, so again, I mean, there are lots and lots of um, school based initiatives that are available from forest school kind of sessions that help eco schools. I know the school that my children go to has got just started up a gardening club where some of the kids are working with the caretaker to help manage the land and 
and bring some of their ideas of what they'd like to see on board. So I think there are a range of things available to, to schools. We have a um, we have an officer at Mersey Forest who works specifically with schools on tree planting and um, initiatives. So again, if, if people want to get in touch with Mersey Forest, we can put you in touch with him. Um, and they and he works with not only setting up new tree and woodland areas within school, but also trying to encourage the school to really make use of those as part of their education resource and enriching the learning of the children. OK, thanks very much, Suzanne. I'm conscious that we've gone to one o'clock now, but I don't mind just maybe overrunning with a minute or two. Uh, there are questions in the chat box. I got one interesting one from Marshall. I think that will be answered, Marshall. So if you just bear it, uh, same is with uh, Lisa Silverman. I just wanted to go to Diane. She's got a hand up and she's live. So Diane, please go yeah. ahead. It's um, just to say um, an interesting point regarding the seeds, wildflower seeds for schools. I wondered if um, Nest Gardens, you know, they have a, they do seeds for friends. They might well um, be interested in joining in that scheme. Um, I'm actually a volunteer with them, but because of COVID, I'm not volunteering at the moment. But I, I could mention it when I'm, uh, I'm going there. I only live two minutes up the road. I, I don't know how you approach these things, but that would be an interesting way of going about it. Yeah, I, I like the idea of um, linking up with local gardens and garden centres and so on, maybe trying to get a dialogue going with, with them um, about how we can link these things together. Um, but if we, we probably have your email from sign up, Diana, so maybe we can have a conversation about that. Um, yes, you have. Yeah. Yeah. OK, thanks, Diane. I think I'm going to take the last question from Peter again and then, uh, yeah, we go from there. Thanks, Peter. Hi, Bridge Trafford, um, where the, the huge landfill site is. What's the final landscaping of that site? Um, it's very much in use at the moment and I don't know how many years it's going to go before it gets filled up, but what are the plans when it is filled up? Is that going to be landscaped and tree planted or, or, or what's the plan, do you know? Uh, from where I am, Peter, I don't know, to be quite honest, but however, we can follow that up uh, with the relevant departments with, within the council and then we can feed that back to you. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Diane, have you got another question of the previous hand, please? Oh, um, no, I didn't know how to put it down. Just a okay. minute. Lower no, my... <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think of that. that out either. Fine. So, uh, <laughs> thank you very much indeed for coming along and thank you so much for your participation. Uh, I didn't manage to go across to the other constraints and barriers people might be having, but please do email them through and then we can feed back to you on those. Uh, I don't see another question and it's three minutes past one. Uh, we've run a little, but however, thank you so much for coming along. Uh, I say goodbye for now. Thank goodbye. you everyone. Thank you, bye bye. bye.